So there's, there's this protest in Oregon at this wildlife refuge, and this is getting all over the internet, and people are saying a lot of things. So I just wanted to come and and give my thoughts. Uh, I, basically, mine are words of you know mildness. Let's all take it easy. <laughs> Let's relax a little bit. Um, <clears throat> You know, there's there's a group of guys that have some grievances against the government, and the government has some issues with these guys, and I'm not going to get too much into what all of those are or who's right and who's wrong, because all of it's really irrelevant to, uh, you know, the questions that I have about the situation and what I'm interested in. Um, I'm sure that this will play out, and what I'm interested in is how. So, um, you know, and why am I interested? And, and that's because... I, I think that this is an excellent case study. This is a situation uh, where some people are doing the thing that a lot of normal people who aren't as um, you know crazy or brave or <laughs> whatever it is you want to call it um, aren't willing to do. And you know anyone who's had their business raided by the government, uh, you know, at, with with guns and. Um, you know, SWAT teams and things, or anyone who's, you know, had a bad experience with the IRS or um, just tried to start a business, you know, had a dream and had a really hard time getting it off the ground because of all of the, um, you know, requirements and, and regulations. Um, there's a lot of people in the country who have these experiences and may have at some point thought, you know, this is a really bad situation and I don't, I don't like you know, where we've gotten. And I didn't know it was like this until I tried to be an entrepreneur. Or I, I tried to, you know, I, I bought a car and had to pay 10% of my purchase price in tax or, you know, whatever it was and been surprised. And, and, and you know, and, and I'm talking about as a low income person or, you know, where that really affects you. And you might have thought, what can I do about this? And most of us, you know, apparently not the Bundys, but most of us answer that question with, with well, essentially nothing. There's nothing really I can do. Um, I'm not going to get violent because that violates my ethics, and I know that I'm going to lose, even if ethics aren't a consideration for you. And I can't, uh, you know, protests probably aren't going to make any difference because who am I? I'm just some little human that lives in a remote place and uh, you know, it would take millions of people protesting for it to make a difference, and that's not going to happen, or at least not because of me. Anyway, the bottom line, uh, you know, there's a, there's a certain hopelessness and helplessness that, uh, you know, we fairly honestly feel or, or fairly accurately feel uh, in our relationship to these issues. So this here is a case study where some people answered a different way. Um for better or for worse, they went and took over a wildlife refuge building. I am not sure if there were any people there when they did that or not. I, in this article I have up here on CNN, it says that the place was closed in one of the tweets. But, uh, you know, getting your news or your information from tweets is not always the best method. Um, which, which I also want to get into here. Uh, you know, let's look at this article. It says, Oregon standoff. Call it a Yal Qaeda attack, say internet users. So this is our headline. The source is internet users, and the headline is a uh, joke from a tweet. Cool. All right, so this is going to be a good article. I can tell already. Um, <laughs> so before we get into this too much, uh, you know, I just, I just want to elaborate a little bit more about, um, you know, this idea that we're watching a group of people standing off against the government. So it doesn't really matter what's really going on. The fact is they feel they're being oppressed. They feel the government has overreached and is abusing its power and has targeted them. And so they have some grievances and they have taken some action and they're resisting, they're disobeying, and they're even prepared to defend themselves with violence. Uh, to get their demands met, and pretty much wholesale. I mean, there are there are a few crazies here and there like me who uh, who have not vilified them immediately, 
Uh, but most people have called them crazy, have called for the government to go shoot them, have called for uh, condemnation, or who have, like this article will do, gone into other issues in name-calling and race-baiting. Um, and I just, I just think that, you know, if we just take a step back here and think, okay, uh, you know, maybe this wasn't a good idea. Maybe they're not doing the right thing, uh, you know. But what a great opportunity. I mean, somebody's, somebody's making this little sacrifice here so we can kind of see how this would go down, right? <laughs> what happens to you when, you when you don't go along? And this will play out and we'll see. But um, I, think it's, I think it's sad that there's so much immediate denunciation and, and vilification because a lot of the people that are doing that are conservatives or people who are fans of the Constitution, just like these militiamen are. Uh, maybe not to that extreme. Uh, the, the people occupying this building believe the Constitution was so inspired that it is equivalent to the Bible. It is sacred. And uh, and anyway, so, so it's, it's on a religious level. And, and I understand that. These, these fellows, they're members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which I'm very familiar with. And they, uh, you know, in, in the church there are a lot of talks and things that, um, that explain to us that the, um, the Constitution was an inspired document uh, created by men who were directed by God, uh, you know, speaking of the Founding Fathers. And so that's taken very literally, it's taken very, uh, very far, and it's often taken to mean that there can be no flaw in the document or in the amendments to the document or in the government that came from the document or in the country that is governed by the government that came from the document. Um, uh, but there is clearly room to uh, debate that, uh, even if you're using the, the scriptures of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which are the Bible, the Book of Mormon, the Pearl of Great Price, and the Doctrine and Covenants. Um, there are... Uh, you know, just like the Declaration of Independence says that, you know, if, if you are, if the government has, is abusing its power, if it has taken away the rights of the people, then it is the duty of the people to rise up and challenge that government. There are similar clauses or exceptions in the LDS scriptures uh, that say as long as the government is not abusing the people, then we are subject to uh, you know, kings, presidents, governments, uh, etc., and that we should follow the laws of the land. So, anyway, uh, for any of you who are LDS or who have heard, uh, you know, things in that direction, don't worry. Uh, if you read the scriptures and you read all of them and you pay attention to even the parts that don't serve your cause or your ideology, um, you know, there is some, some rationality there. And, and so what I'm interested in here, uh, oh, and, and before I move on, the church also has made a statement um, separating itself from this action. Uh, the, the men that have taken over this, like I said, they're members of that church, and not only are they members, but in some of their interviews, uh, they have said things like, you know, I am Captain Moroni, or, you know, God is supporting us in, in what we're doing. And the church has come out and said, uh, you know, while the disagreeing, disagreement occurring in Oregon about the use of federal lands is not a church matter, church leaders strongly condemn the armed seizure of the facility and are deeply troubled by the reports that those who have seized the facility suggest they are doing so based on scriptural principles. And uh, again, it reaffirms that we should settle our grievances with the government with peaceful means according to the laws of the land. And I think that what the church is doing here, because the church doesn't get too involved in political things. They did get involved in the gay marriage issue. Uh, but what they're doing here is distancing themselves from this. If it goes badly, uh, you know, they don't, they don't want people to think that the church directed this or inspired this or agrees with this because that's not the case. It's just some people who are members of the church and who uh, have interpreted the scriptures and doctrines a certain way. And the church doesn't want to be held responsible for, 
you know, what if they shoot somebody? You know, he, the, the church isn't going to want to be tied to that. So I can understand that, and this makes sense. And I agree that we should, to the best of our ability, settle issues peacefully and according to the laws of the land where the laws are just. Uh, the problem is, and the problem becomes, in certain situations, um, there, there's, it's basically a conflict of interest. If you took a, you know, if you were in a corporation and you were an employee, you were a computer programmer, and your boss was treating you badly, you know, maybe, maybe it was a woman and she was sexually harassing you and it was unwelcome, and she was belittling you in front of your peers and she paid you too little, maybe she dropped your pay after hiring you and she, she didn't like your work and she would, anyway, it, pretend the list goes on and she's just doing terrible things. In, in business life, when you're an employee, you're supposed to go to your superiors and report the behavior. But you don't go to the person who is causing the problem. You don't go to the person you have a problem with. You go to their superior or you go to you know, someone outside uh, your department or you know, whatever it is. So if it's the government, though, who's above the government? You know, if the government has made a law or they've taken action uh, that violates your rights or, or you feel it does and you're, you're being uh, inhibited from making your living or there's some injustice against you, your only option under the law is to go to the government and say, hey, government, you are trying to take away my land or you are uh, you know, infringing on my rights. And the government will say, no, we're not. The government will say, you're on our land, or you, you know, you're guilty of these six things, and let's go to court about it, and we'll make sure that you're guilty. I'm not saying this happens all the time, but there have been examples in history where the justice system was not just. And it only takes one such instance for it to be um, potentially justified to take other action. If you can't get justice under the law, do you just suffer the injustice? And again, that's something that I think is up to each individual and you have to consider, you have to think through, what are the consequences of this? How important is this justice to me? What am I willing to do and suffer to obtain a just situation or resolution? So anyway, I'm not saying I disagree with the church. Um, I, I agree, I just think it's important that we uh, we recognize that not only are there times when it's required to take another path to obtain justice, but we should look to the Founding Fathers for the greatest example of all under our Constitution of people who saw injustice, resisted, declared independence, and then were prepared to defend their independence with violence if necessary, and that's what happened. It was called the Revolutionary War. So, you know, if you're going to say that under no circumstances should you ever resist the government, and you're saying that because you're patriotic and you love the government and you think that this is an inspired and sacred state and that it's never wrong, <laughs> uh, it was born out of resistance to tyranny. Um, and, and most people, when they think of tyranny, they think of post-apocalyptic, um, you know, stormtroopers and, uh, you know, mass slaughter of civilians. Um, but, but that, you know, that's, that's extreme tyranny, but there are small tyrannies. And, uh, if you don't feel like you can obtain justice through the system to the small tyrannies or to a large tyranny, then uh, again, you need to, you know, you're, I'm sure that these guys had, to, they, they went through this process where they're like, okay, hey, now we need to consider. We know that the BLM is, and I'm, I'm again speaking from their point of view, not necessarily as fact, but, um, you know, we feel that they are after us. We feel that they don't like that we didn't sell them our land. We feel that they... Uh, they have been using manipulative tactics to try to blame things on us that are not true so that they can justify their actions against, uh, you know, and, and then they're going to go to the BLM and complain. Um, and maybe they have, but, you know, 
usually usually if your boss is treating you badly and you go report it to your boss uh, you know you're not going to expect great results you might even risk expect retaliation so there's a big conflict of interest there I, I hope you can see it and i hope that you can remember that the founding fathers who you know allegedly embody all american values they were the original they were the original resistors the original declarers of their independence, the original disobeyers. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that is really the legacy of uh, the beginnings of this country. So I, I hope that in the future, if I'm ever oppressed or I'm ever in a situation where I'm my family has un unjustly been, uh, you know, taken from me or I've been arrested uh, on false charges and I'm not giving a, given a fair due process, you know, a chance to prove my innocence, not that you should have to, they should have to prove your guilt. But I would hope in that situation that I was able to receive justice and that if I was not able to receive justice, that I was supported by my peers in uh, seeking justice in an alternative uh, method. So, keep that in mind. Uh, I'm not saying that these guys are great and that what they're doing is right, but I'm just saying that this is a great case study. And, uh, and now I want to go into uh, a little bit about this article here. So, I already read you the title. It says, you know, call it a Al-Qaeda attack, says Internet users. There's a video here where this, this expert man uh, is talking to this American flag. I, I haven't watched it. I don't know what he's saying, but, uh, you know, he's talking about them taking over the refuge. They're going to show some videos they probably got from civilians who sold them for, they licensed them for uh, 50 bucks or something, and or stock footage of people with guns. Um, that's usually what they do. And then the very first line, I want to point this out to you, the very first line in this article is dozens of heavily armed white people have taken over a federal building in Oregon, so why aren't they being called, you know, terrorists? Uh, what is white people, what does is, what is them being white have to do with anything? And we'll find out. Oh, we'll find out. That's the question internet users have been asking after the government, anti-government protesters. So, why, 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 why is this giant news organization with millions and millions of dollars in their budget, why are they dedicating an entire article to what the internet is saying? Is that news? Is what's happening news? Or is what the internet's saying about what's happening news? You might say that what the internet's saying is news if it was something remarkable, but clearly in this article it is not because it's just this is this whole article is just two things. It's the internet is saying that this is a race issue and the internet is making jokes about this. That's it. That's what this whole article is. Good job, CNN. It says double standard. Okay, so here's the race part. So they found a bunch of people who are really interested in the race issue and they posted their tweets and then they commented on their tweets and then they posted their tweets and then they commented on their tweets. There's a comparison of the situation here in Oregon to Black Lives Matter, hashtag BLM, which also stands for Bureau of Land Management, so that's kind of confusing. Um, Anyway, so more tweets. Oh, they got somebody of a different race and then posted their tweet and they got a woman and posted her tweet and they got someone uh, named Mohammed and they posted his tweet. There's a, a man named Larry with a female picture, posted his tweet. And then they got Paul Joseph Watson who works for Alex Jones and posted his tweet. Uh, cool. So then we move into Yal Al-Qaeda. Oh, so we got some jokes here. So this is like, they're waging jihad, and there's a poem here to the beat of Ice Ice Baby. 
and they say Vanilla Isis in it. That's kind of fun. That's kind of catchy. And I got to give them credit. That's good. I mean, the tweeter, but see, I don't know why CNN is posting this on their news article. Yokel Haram. Cool. So that's the end. That's the whole article. So this is a pretty large and heavily funded company, and uh, they they have a lot of infrastructure. They have the potential to do some great reporting. Most people who are independent journalists, who are like YouTubers who are going around and doing guerrilla journalism or, you know, just doing interviews on their on their blog or podcast and trying to get to the bottom of issues, you know, they travel around and, and do undercover journalism, maybe like Project Veritas, for example. Do you know what these people would give for the kind of budget that CNN has? That is the only thing limiting them from expanding and doing more of what they do. CNN has that and has had it for many years, as well as Fox News and you know MSNBC and all these things. They got huge budgets, unbelievable budgets. Some of their newscasters, in air quotes, essentially people who sit behind a desk and read, make tens of millions of dollars a year in salary. Like they literally get paid to sit behind a desk and read tens of millions of dollars. So there's no shortage in the budget of these 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 uh, corporations. So if that's the case, why is the best journalism they can do to write articles that say, what are people saying online? Why do they source all of their video from people with cell phones? Why are all the people they interview on the payroll of CNN? Why are so many of the talking points and uh, news sources that they have straight from the White House, straight from the CIA, straight from government sources. And, you know, if, if I didn't know what some of these people got paid, again, I would think it's because they didn't have enough money. Oh, you know, journalism's dying because of the internet, because of YouTube, and they just aren't getting funded because people aren't watching it anymore. And so they have to cut back. But clearly that's not the case. There's There's obviously some other reason that the quality has gone so downhill. And I think that it's really notable, and, and I think it's terrific that there are so many people now who are really starting to question and uh, be skeptical of these news sources. I mean, look at this thing. Look at this little video right here. So I'll play it so we can see this guy move his mouth up and down. So we've got some video here. And it's in front of a Safeway. And we don't know if this is from this event. We don't know if this is from the last little standoff they had. Here's a guy with some makeup on um, telling us some stuff. And they've got all these graphics and all these animations. When CNN's videos begin, there's all these things flying around and it makes it look pretty. Behind this guy, I mean, is he really standing in front of a, a city right now? Well... Clearly not. He's probably in his, his bedroom. He's probably not wearing pants. And this is a blue screen or a green screen. And he's just sticking that on there to look official. And he's probably making fifteen, you know, ten thousand dollars or you know, something like that for this appearance. And what is he? He's a law enforcement and analyst. A CNN law enforcement analyst. What does that mean? If you look these people up when they're on these news shows that they interview as experts, they always have these vague name, vague titles, and then when you look them up, you find that they either work for the government or they work for the Council on Foreign Relations or they're full, you know, they're they're solely employed by the news company and they just have this title that the news company gave them and they use them to interview because they're good at talking. So, uh, you know, for, for those of us who are raised on the internet, it's become, you know, it, it's really natural for us to be skeptical. It's really natural for us to ask questions and to not believe what we're told immediately because since we were born, 
30 times a day, we're getting spam emails telling us that we've just been gifted 10 million pounds from our dead great uncle in London. Uh, and the person writing the email, for some reason, sounds like they're from Nigeria and doesn't know English very well. And we're used to this. This is just commonplace. When people tell us things, we just know there's a good chance that you're lying. We understand people's motives. We understand there's an agenda. And we, we, we don't mind because we understand that people are driven uh, by movements and causes and, and you know, to make a living and, and that there's value in those things. But we just know it. And so whenever we're told something, we pause and we say, okay, how much of that is baloney? How much can I believe? Why are they using all these graphics? Why is there a ticker down here? Is there ever anything important in the ticker? You know, is this a green screen or is he really in a foggy place with a light shining on his head? Um, and, and why do they do this? Be because, because the wall is not attractive? I mean, it's all just to make it look professional. And as long as it looks professional, people trust it, especially people over the age of 40. If you ever noticed uh, that older people tend to be very trusting, especially of institutions. Back in the 50s, people loved their big institutions. People, people weren't asking questions back then. There was no internet. There weren't review sites. There weren't, you couldn't just go to Google and type in, you know, a company name and scam and have information from other people's experience just there before your eyes. And we weren't getting email. And an email, you know, 90% of what you get is baloney and, and spam and scams. So now when I watch this, I'm just really, I just feel manipulated. I feel like all of this is a, a show, uh, which I can understand. I'm a video professional. I understand why they're doing it. Uh, and if everything that they were telling me was true and verifiable, if they had show notes, if they had people on the ground doing investigative journalism, then I wouldn't mind that I was being manipulated to think they were professional. But look, who's this guy? Chief Legal Affairs Analyst, ABC News. Okay, so here's a guy from a different news agency that they brought on this news agency to talk about things. I mean, it just goes on. This is how it works. These are just people whose entire profession is talking on the news. And uh, they don't investigate anything. All they do is hire videos from cell phone users and then talk about them with themselves. And uh, then they put articles up with people's tweets because that's a reliable source of news. Right. So anyway, I... I've, I've heard a lot of people with a lot of responses. Again, I've heard people even saying, you know, go, go shoot those guys. They're, if you're going to attack the government, then you should be killed. And I, I just want to leave you with, uh, you know, remember that, you know, the government is just a tool. And if you are willing to send the government to kill them, then you should be willing to go and shoot them yourself. And um, if you're not willing to do that, then please just <laughs> take a deep breath and, uh, you know, don't advocate things that um, are a violation, clearly, of your basic ethics. If you're not willing to go and pull the trigger and end their lives, then don't send the government to do it. Don't claim that that's a good idea or that that's the way it should be. You know, let's get these guys and put them through a due process and let them be charged with a crime and let some prosecutors prove their guilt. And, uh, you know, if that's, if that's the system we want, then, you know, let's at least adhere to the system. So thanks for listening. And uh, that kind of leads us into the next topic I'll discuss on my next, on my next uh, release. And that'll be more about the nature of government. What is government? And uh, I think that it's something we should understand on a basic level so that in situations like this, we don't uh, do things or say things we regret. Thanks for listening, and I'm out of here.